Michelle Livesey from um, Hits Radio. I'm the, it's formerly Key 103, as many of you may know, <laughs> but we've changed the name now to Hits Radio. Uh, so I'm the news editor there, and I'm going to be hosting tonight's questions uh, to Crescent Town with Andy Burnham. Um, obviously, this is Andy Burnham. <laughs> um, are we going to be streaming? Do you need to let me know when we're, we're streaming now, aren't we? Okay, right, brilliant. Okay, so... Um, we've had some questions submitted, so some people obviously have been lucky enough to have their question chosen tonight, so we're going to go through the questions. Um, first of all, we'll have a quick chat with Andy, because it's been a busy day for you today, isn't it? Well, every day is a busy day for <laughs> yeah. the Mayor of Greater Manchester, but um, I know you've made a particular announcement with the fire service today, haven't yeah. you? Um, yeah. Obviously, we all know about what happened at the arena, and then there was the Kerr's Lake report that came out in the aftermath about what lessons could be learned from that. And I know the fire service was one particular area of interest. Um, so that's something you've been looking at today. How did that go, and what changes have you been looking at? Yeah, it's gone uh, well, thanks, uh, Michelle. So you're right, it began with the, um, the attack on the arena and then the Kurzlake report. And people may remember it, it brought out a difficult issue for the fire service, which was that on the night, uh, the, the way the service responded meant that, well, they didn't respond at the arena. Uh, and that caused a lot of un, uh, unhappiness, if you like, in the ranks of the fire service. And when Lord Kurzlake uh, did his report, he, he said it, actually was a product of a deeper issue within the within the, the fire service around culture and leadership and he advised us the deputy mayor and I who's uh, here this evening to take a a more root and branch look at the uh, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service which is what we've been doing over the last uh, few months and to be honest we've not done it in that kind of management speak jargon type way with spreadsheets and all of that we, we've been out to fire stations I have to say the Deputy Mayor has beat me. She's done 23 fire station visits. I've only done 14. But we made a commitment just to get out and talk to people um, and hear from frontline firefighters particularly about how the service seems to them. Um, and what it, what it flushed out, flushed out actually was a feeling that the frontline had been a bit neglected actually in recent, in recent times. Um, so we've made some announcements today. We are uh, going to um, have a, a real frontline first culture from here on in. Um, we've uh, put in place a new shift system, which is needed because they don't, the, the arrangements are not very fam family friendly at all at the moment. Firefighters can't choose their annual leave, they just get given dates. It's, it's not been an organisation, I think, that's embodied that, that approach to, uh, to, to putting the frontline first. So we've We've, we've made some steps today towards putting things, uh, putting things right. We've announced a new chief, uh, Jim Wallace, who was previously in charge uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and we've had strong backing from the FBU for the changes that we've made. So this has been very much done with people rather than uh, two people. So it's a bit of a new beginning today for the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. And actually, it, it did give me an opportunity today to say, you know, that was a difficult moment, but, but we've all seen, haven't we, in recent weeks, the strength of our fire service, the value of our fire service in terms of the work they've been doing uh, up on the moors. You know, we just, I, I mean, I, you know, in those moments when the fire was first ripping through the countryside, honestly, it was a frightening thing to see it. And, you know, I saw them in those moments trying to deal with that huge task, and they did it with great professionalism. Uh, so I was saying, you know, it was a difficult month, a day a few months ago, now, obviously, we can see that the fire service has got, um, got, got great um, uh, commitment, uh, delivers a great service. And so from here, we now move forward. And I think today is a, you know, it's gone down well today. And I think we move forward from here now. OK, bro. Well, obviously, that's looking at the fire service. Um, one question, or the first question of the evening that we've got is from Russ George. Is Russ George here tonight? Hi, Russ. Would you like to... This is a, a policing question, really, so it's moving on from the fire service. Do you want to ask your question? So am I. Hello? Hello? Um, right, so my question was... Um, the question was on public safety, mainly street safety and canal safety, and supporting the call for 17 gates to be installed along with CCTV monitored... Um, across the city, with uh, or across Manchester city centre, with call points um, to help police in their work in making 
the canal is a safer place, but also to address antisocial behaviour and other issues that we're seeing along the canals, including yeah. things like mobikes being thrown into the canals regularly. Yeah. Um, so I'll leave that to Andrew to answer. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a good question. Um, people who are regular viewers of these events will know that whenever I get difficult questions, I deflect them to uh, the Deputy Chief or the Deputy Mayor, who are both here tonight. But um, no, on this one, I, you know, we'll, um, maybe if, if Ian wants to come in, Ian Pilling, Deputy Chief Constable, wants to come in, uh, by all means, Ian. But um, there is an issue, isn't there, of, as you say, antisocial behaviour. But, but worse, we've actually had uh, really sad cases recently of people uh, falling in on a night out and uh, fatalities of, of young people, particularly uh, a young man, uh, Charlie Pope, uh, whose family have been campaigning for safety improvements uh, in Manchester City Centre. Um, so I've met uh, uh, Charlie's dad, Nick, um, and I had that discussion. I think it's not practical, is it, to, to fence off the whole of the, the canal? I mean, the same would apply here, wouldn't it? You know, you, you would. Well, you know, it just, we, just, we just couldn't do that. But I think we could, though, take a look at particular vulnerabilities and particular places where, you know, a number of incidents seem to be, uh, seem to be occurring. Um, and that's what we're going to do. So there is a water safety partnership in the city centre. Uh, what we've committed to is to have a meeting with uh, Charlie's family, um, the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents and others, uh, with the Canals and Rivers Trust. Uh, to see if we can address some of those uh, issues. It's, you know, it's, it's been a recurring issue, hasn't it, around Manchester City Centre for a number of, a number of years. And um, Pat Carney, Council Pat Carney, has said that you know, that the City Council are willing to make some permanent improvements um, in, in various locations. So we're going to have that meeting, have that discussion. I think there's also a, a case for more uh, information to younger people, particularly university students, about the risks on a night out of being around some of those places where you know, perhaps they are at greater risk and you know, avoiding going down the canal on their own at certain hours is probably a, a wise thing to, to, to do. So maybe a campaign around uh, the university uh, community as well. But you, you're raising a good question. It's a topical one uh, and we're going to have that meeting, I think September, October, to discuss exactly what we do. I know one of the things that I covered recently was one of the initiatives around that was getting the bars involved because yep. you know sort of obviously a lot of it is coming from people spilling out of the bars and trying to to yeah. walk home and i thought one of the interesting things they were doing was the, t the education but the water safety and also teaching people how to rescue people from the canals as well i mean you shouldn't have to do that but i think it's that education side of things isn't it that's that's really important it, it is definitely and i think you know the um the bars do have a, a, a role uh, to play in this we've appointed a uh, a nighttime economy uh, advisor um, to Greater Manchester because you know, there are lots of issues that arise on, um, uh, on uh, nights out. The Deputy Mayor was very, very keen on this. You know, there was uh, a call from young women students at the university that they launched a campaign called Reclaim the Night because there have been issues with taxis and whether or not people can trust in the safety of, of, of the taxis they're getting into. Um, a whole set of things actually linked to uh, safety in the nighttime economy. Um, it's only Berry, I think I'm right in saying, that has what's called purple flag status, which is a, a kind of standard for good, good safety at, at, uh, at night. And we would like more of our, more of our towns to, um, to embrace uh, that um, approach because, you know, it is about policing. It's possibly also about the NHS providing more facilities for people to go if they're a bit the worse for wear and, you know, a bit of time out and a bit of time to, to recover. Um, but as I say, taxis too. So people may know that we've recently agreed uh, in principle to look at whether or not we should develop a Greater Manchester standard for taxi regulation. At the moment, all the 10 boroughs do something slightly different. They all do have good standards, but they all apply different uh, principles. And we're wondering whether or not the time is right to bring through a Greater Manchester approach, where we might even have a single livery so t all taxis are the same colour, so everyone knows which are the, you know, the, the taxis that, that meet the GM standard. So these are the ideas that we're working on at the moment geared to the whole question of uh, a, a safer nighttime economy and, as Ian and his colleagues will often call on us, um, later running of Metrolink uh, because that can help. You know, if the police can, can't really move people through away from those gatherings outside the bars, it means that you can get, you know, large crowds in the city centre 
in the early hours of the morning, and that can present public safety issues as well. And they say that if you have later running Metrolink, that helps with the whole management of, of all of those issues. How much ridiculous do like the voluntary groups that we see, I mean, they're fantastic, aren't they? The street angels, the village angels, and um, those are the people that kind of volunteer their time to, to patrol city centres and, and help people get home so safely. How much do they make a difference, particularly for policing, because, it, you know, a time when policing um, is difficult in terms of the budget cuts, you know, these voluntary organisations are, I presume, a bit of a lifeline, really. They definitely are. I mean, maybe Deputy Mayor would like to come in. Obviously, this is her responsibility. But the Village Angels, absolutely, they do a brilliant uh, job. And you know, I think there's a model there that we could, we could uh, build on. But yet, yeah, we also need to recruit more police as best we can, given that we are still facing cuts to our central government grant. Uh, we have asked you all to pay, I'm afraid, a bit more council tax to recruit more police. And GMP are on with that at the moment. We're planning to recruit 100 more police officers. That's the first time we're acti actively adding to the numbers for the uh, eight years. We have put more PCSOs on Metrolink, um, and as part of the new uh, franchise for Metrolink, the operator has committed to put more what we call more travel safe officers on, on Metrolink. I know there's been issues, particularly in Oldham actually, but also here as well, around um, incidents, anti-social behaviour on Metrolink late at night. So. I think we've got to do. We've got to look at everything, is what I would uh, would say. I don't know if Bev wants to uh, add anything to to that. Uh, yes, thanks, Andy. I think as as far as the um, the voluntary organisations that you mentioned, Michelle, they're, they're really important and they do a great job. We actually fund them um, with with, uh, with money to support their activity. A whole range of organisations, Village Angels, uh, Street Pastors, as well, and uh, not just in Manchester City Centre. There's actually small teams of pastors in other town centres across Greater Manchester. Um, but as Andy said, I think in some places it would be good to have a greater NHS kind of presence for, for, for time out, and we're talking to the ambulance service uh, uh, about that. Um, I think in the city centre, um, there are big issues, aren't there, Ian, in terms of Manchester city centre, because that's the place that draws young people from, from everywhere. Um, and there's a whole range of issues that we're trying to, to work with there, Ian, and say something in a minute. I'll just say one thing, though. Although um, you know, there's a, a lot of concern and campaigns by young women in terms of their vulnerability in the city centre, I think we, all, we also need to start talking to, to young men, actually, um, because I think for, for young women, very often their friends are kind of school to look after them if somebody is worse for the wear and won't let them go off on their own. Whereas actually with young men, it's a different issue. And it's both of those youngsters who died in the canal were young men and they went off on their own and they weren't really capable of looking after themselves. So with the bars and with all groups of students, men and women, I think we've got a big education programme to, to do, which we, we want to start on. Yeah, sure. I mean, as, as Bev said, I mean, the city centre is a real challenge to us. And I, I think you end up sort of trying to balance two things. One is, you know, we all want the city centre to be vibrant and, and to succeed economically. And a big part of that is, is the nightlife and people coming into the city from across Greater Manchester and beyond. The flip side of that is, you know, we, we, we've got to police it. And every officer we put into the city centre on a Friday and Saturday night isn't doing something else in Greater Manchester. And that's the balance that we have to strike so we have to work with the bars you know we we, we enforce licensing legislation really robustly and as andy said you know we, we we need to look at better transport links and getting people does anyone got anything to add on that uh the lady there uh smith just to your your right if you can get the microphone to <laughs> it's like past the parcel hi andy hi. um I just wanted to add to the, um, the point about the Metrolink. Um, I live in Milno, New Hay area, which is on the Metrolink line um, into Rochdale, which is apparently like the worst for vandalism and um, antisocial behaviour. Um, so we regularly have issues with our stations being vandalised. Um, people can't get tickets because they don't want to use the Metrolink. There's a severe lack of Metrolink staff um, around on the trams. Um, I just wondered how... Um, and I'm sorry, and s uh, staff and passengers are regularly verbally and physically attacked on, on the Metrolink. Um, 
So it's, it's a real problem around here. Um, so I was just wondering how GMCA is, and yourself are going to tackle this problem and in what time frame. Um, we need a more regular presence of Metrolink staff or police on our line at the moment just to get a grip of this situation because it's young people and it's not just in the evening. In fact, it probably isn't in the evening, to be honest. That's usually drunken revelers. Um, but, but the kids are just causing havoc. I mean, we've got um, a vandalised station. We're only one day into the summer holidays and we've already got stations yeah. vandalised and yeah. totally out of use. Well, no, you're, a, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a growing problem, um, and we have to get a grip on it because, as you say, in the end, it will deter people from using what is and should be a great public transport uh, system. It is a great system, but not if people are feeling uh, vulnerable when using it. And it does seem there's been a growing spate of incidents in all the Prompt, what, what goes through the mind of somebody to, to, to do that, you know, and, and to, um, you know, put, put um, a brick or a stone through the window of a Metrolink uh, tram? I, I think we maybe should look at tougher sanctions and, and penalties. You know, we've asked the Home Secretary, actually, for the power to ban people from Metrolink. And uh, the previous Home Secretary, actually, she agreed, which was a really good, good step. And we now just need to kind of bring through that... Um, that power so that we can you know make sure that people who are offending on the system are ultimately banned from using it and I think you know more of that kind of intervention is possibly what's needed Bob do you want to add anything yeah just to add to that Andy um, in terms of vandalism we probably have three trams out of service every day of the week just due to vandalism uh, so some people will be getting a single rather than a double um, it's very sad because when it was the old rundown heavy rail system there wasn't that much vandalism. We make something new and great for the community, and it seems to attract people. I have to say that the work Ian's team have done, in conjunction with Metrolink staff, we're starting to see some impact. It is coming down, but we've got to really drive it home to those small groups that are obsessing it for everyone. Is it coming down, Bob? The number of incidents that we're recording is dropping, is it? The actual number of incidents that have been recorded is slightly up, but that's because we've got more PCSOs out there reporting the incidents, but actually the seriousness, the regular ones, are decreasing. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next topic. Screen of, a, of a metro link, you know, that, that put. Um, others can be drawn into the gangs that are, you know, around uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, behaviour. And, and actually, I think to pick up your point, I mean, 
I think in London, where there's been a bigger issue with gang and knife violence recently, a lot of people say it is very linked to cuts to youth services of about, you know, well, 2010 onwards. And that is part of the issue, that they've lost that uh, ability to divert young people in evenings and weekends. I want to just share with you something that actually still is, is a I keep quoting this every time I uh, comment about this theme of young people at the moment, because it's, it sticks in my mind, and it will in yours after I tell you. We're doing a lot of work at the moment. When I stood for election as mayor, I said I wanted you know, to use devolution to, to, to change some of the norms of politics, because you know, what's the point, actually? If you, you know, there's no point asking for devolution just to carry on doing the, old, the same old, the same old that hasn't got us very far. And the particular thing I said was, you know, how can you have an approach where young people are the target for cuts? You know, if you're always kind of making savings off the back of young people, you cannot build a strong society on that basis. You really can't. So as part of that, we've been doing a lot of work on what we call life readiness. How do you help young people make a successful transition from secondary school to, you know, college, an apprenticeship, or whatever it might be, to work? And as part of that work, we did a survey of 300 young people. I think they were drawn from Oldham and Rochdale, so some from your borough, some from Oldham. And amongst other things, they were asked a simple question. Do you have hope for your own future? It's interesting to think you know, what your thoughts would be now about how people answered that question. It shocks me and it really kind of saddens me that 40% of young people asked that question in these two boroughs were not able to say uh, that they had hope for their future. And these are young people in year 9, year 10. Now, you know, as I say, I don't excuse people who do things like attacking Metrolink uh, trams. However, if, you are if you've got a situation where four out of ten kids are leaving secondary school without hope for the future, you have a major issue, don't you, in terms of wider social problems that will, that will come from that. And it's why, I mean, I'm not saying we've got reams of policies now to kind of deal with it, but one is the commitment towards a, a free bus pass for 16 to 18 year olds, because, you know, if there's one thing I can do, it's send a simple message of hope to every young person that we will try and help them get from where they are after school to, to something positive in life. And that's not going to solve all of the issues we're dealing with, but you have to start somewhere, don't you? And I think the, the point you're making is a, is a good one. I don't have a budget to put in place all of the youth clubs and all of the provision that I would want to see. But I am, it's not easy, but I'm working to see if I can find a way of funding that free bus pass. Because I think, you know, if you can begin to give more people hope, I think you begin to get a better answer to the, to the problem that we're discussing. Any more questions before we move on? Oh, you sir. Uh, my name is Gulam uh, My question is, I have, I have uh, the home uh, office report which states uh, the crimes are on the increase. You know, 37% in the country and uh, the hate crime, 29% increase. I mean, this is happening with the reduction of uh, uh, budget and also with the reduction of uh, uh, so number of officers. Uh, what actions and plans you have to tackle with this in Greater Manchester area, please? Yeah, they're not good statistics, are they? Um, they're, they're not good at all. And again, maybe the Deputy Mayor might want to, to add something to this. I mentioned one of them before, which is I, you know, I am, within the limited resources we have, trying to recruit more police officers. So we did ask people to pay more on their council tax and we, we took the maximum flexibility we had there to both protect the PCSOs and begin a recruitment campaign. But we need more police officers. We've lost too many uh, in recent years and it's, that's the bottom. There's no getting away from that. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, if, if the police aren't there and a kind of feeling builds that, oh, if you can do that, if you can shoplift or you can do something and then you won't face any follow-up, well, it emboldens people, doesn't it? And they start to do more and more. Um, so, you know, the, the campaign that's been run around police cuts is, a, is the right one, uh, in my view. Greater Manchester has limited ability to raise money, though, from council tax. You know, the shires and the more affluent parts of the country can raise a lot of money 
from a small amount on their council tax, whereas we can't. We are very much dependent on that big government grant. Uh, and we've had eight years of cuts to that. So we're trying to sort of do our best to, to stem the, the tide, but, uh, you know, within limits, I guess. And until there's a bit of a change of heart on police funding, then I think we're always, you know, we're not going to be where we would want to be and where the chief constable and the deputy chief want to be. More positively, though you're right, there's been a rise in, in hate crime, not just here but across the country, but, but here as well. Greater Manchester was singled out uh, this week as one of the best forces in the country for tackling uh, hate crime. And I think that is a reflection of the partnership between GMP and the community groups, faith groups of all kinds across uh, Greater Manchester, a zero tolerance uh, approach, uh, and that will always be our approach to, to hate crime uh, in Greater Manchester. Do you have anything to, to add or entirely? I was just going to bring Ian in actually here because I know hate crime is, is, a, is a big one that Greater Manchester Police has been tackling for a while now, lead, leading the way in terms of recognising it as a, an actual an, an offence. What is it that Greater Manchester's doing, do you think, that singles us out to say that we, <coughs> we are leading the way in terms of tackling it? A few things. I think, as Andy said, we're doing a lot of work in partnership because this isn't something the police can sort in isolation. Um, I think we've raised confidence in communities to raise hate crime. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we've got some extra reporting for crime. I'm sure there's been a, a, an increase anyway. You know, we've seen an increase ever since um, the Brexit vote, and then again since the terrorist attacks of, of last year, which, which you know, is really un unfortunate. And we're doing all we can to address it. Um, we try and take victims seriously um, and we try and put an investigation in play whenever we can to try and bring the responsible to justice. Uh, and we just try and build confidence in communities that if we don't know about crimes taking place, then we can't do anything about it. And I think through that approach and through some hard work in key areas of Greater Manchester, we, we've got the confidence now of victims that we didn't used to have. We're not perfect, as Andy said, we've come out of the report uh, well. But that said, there's some issues for us as well, and we need to get better, and we're looking at those going forward. And it is linked to our previous discussion about the public transport system, because that often is a place where you can see a lot of, of hate-related uh, incidents, and um, you know, extra presence on the system, I think, is, is part of the answer to it. And there's a question at the back now. My name's Reverend Catherine Pins. We re recently reported a crime for personal reasons. We engaged a roofer who stole money, materials, even lead off the roof, and we didn't get. We got a response off the police that they weren't going to investigate. Now we're in a country where policing was by consent, and I have little faith in the police now as a response to that. We're talking about vandals. How are they going to learn if nothing's being done about it? Mm. And that's the same with the criminals that are getting away with things. I think in principle we'd all absolutely uh, agree and, and, I, and I do and have challenged GMP uh, to say you know, we, we need to be on the front foot uh, in terms of investigating uh, crime, and I'm not going to, so, you know, I don't know the particulars of your case, but I have had other cases brought to me where, you know, I didn't feel the response was, was adequate, and, you know, you can't always say it's cuts, can you? I don't think that's always, you know, that's not always acceptable because, you know, judgments have to be made, and, you know, I think sometimes crimes aren't in investigated where they should be. That said, there is a kind of point though about resource, isn't it? There is only so much uh, time that they have got given uh, the numbers that they have and there are crimes increasing, therefore the, you know, they've got fewer numbers, more crimes and therefore something potentially has to give, doesn't it, in the, in the system. Uh, so, I mean, what I would say is we, we've definitely hit a point where we, you know, we cannot carry on, there, there has to be a change starting with this budget and the next spending review uh, that will come next year where police resources need to start rising again because we've, we've heard actually what the consequences are and, and sadly there will be some situations where GMP can't give the response to you that they would want to give to you. Now I'm not I say, can't, I'm going to defend every incident because sometimes the wrong judgments are made 
but you know, I think it's only being honest to say the service starts to fall when you get to a position where police numbers are low, crime is up. You know, you, you cannot provide the same service that people perhaps have become used to five or ten years ago in those in those circumstances, and that is a really tough thing to have to, to say. But that that is the position I think that we currently find ourselves in. I'm a, I'm a, Am I saying it? Have I, have I summarised it correctly? I mean, I, you know, I think hearing stories like that that I've just heard is probably the hardest part of my job, um, because, as, as you've said, Andy, you know, crime levels are increasing and police officer numbers have decreased. And unfortunately, and I take no pleasure in this at all, we are not able to investigate every crime. We have to apply a criteria around threat, harm, and risk. But if you're the victim, if you've had your car broken into or your house broken into, being told that there's not sufficient threat, harm and risk there to warrant an investigation is little comfort to you. Um, there, is a, there is a harsh reality, as you've said, that we have to allocate the resource to the crimes where it's, it's most needed, where there is a, a risk to life, where young, young people might have been involved. Uh, but as you said, we do get it wrong sometimes. And last week, now your office brought something to my attention on Friday, we, we got it wrong. And I think we need to hold our hand up and say, look, you know, we're doing our best here to process all this crime. We're trying to allocate the resource, which is limited as best as we can. Um, on the whole, I think we do a pretty good job, but sometimes we do drop the ball and we don't get it right all the time. Well, no, thanks for, for your honesty there, Ian. And, you know, just, you know, I think we can only give you an honest answer to the question. Um, I can tell you from the Deputy Mayor's point of view and mine, we will never allow a defeatism, you know, and we will challenge, and we do challenge, you've just heard I did challenge last week on a particular case that was brought to my attention. Um, and we'll continue to do that, but we also have to recognise the context in which they're, they're, they're running. And I can just say, and I know the ten leaders of Greater Manchester and councillors will back me up on this, we need to make that call for more resources for Greater Manchester Police louder and louder and louder, because we cannot carry on in this way. We will, as much as we can, we will not cut the front line. You know, we, we, the front line first principle that I described in relation to the fire service absolutely applies to our police service uh, as well. Uh, and as I say, we've increased it modestly this, this year. But, you know, going forward, we, we would want to see that, that, that increase much more. And that will need the government to be more of a partner with us in, in, that, uh, in that whole approach. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question at the front here. Oh. Uh, just, just this guy here who's waving at me. Um. Thank you very much. I do appreciate and I commiserate all heartedly with the cuts in the police. Younger man that I were, we always had a call. I appreciate the cuts. I get very, very frustrated. We split into four townships and unfortunately I'm the smallest township, numbers related, so I don't have as many people on the beat. That is frustrating. The 101 don't get any sense as far as my constituents are concerned. You've mentioned PCSOs. How much power do they have? I say uniform presence is a must. And how many we've got, but we can't spread them about. Do they finish at 11 o'clock? How much power have they got to make an arrest? How much power have they got to put an influence in there? Yeah, that, that is obviously a, you know, a common... Um issue that's raised about PCSOs, but we've had them now for what, about 15 years in Greater Manchester. I think most communities value them because they tend to be out and about, uh, they tend to be known by the community. That's certainly my experience in Lee, uh, you know, that, that they're, they've become, you know, a, a kind of trusted face of, of the police. And
We need to be calling on um, Sefer Javid as the new Home Secretary to actually increase funding back to appropriate levels for policing across the country, not just in Greater Manchester. I agree with you wholeheartedly on the first point. Ian, John, about the specials, yeah. Yeah, I mean, specials are really valuable to us. Uh, we've, we've got about 500 across uh, Greater Manchester. Um, they are volunteers. They're not free. They need to be recruited and, and, and trained. And part of the problem we've had uh, is a lot of our regular police officers now uh, come from the specials. So we've got a bit of revolving doors, people coming into the specials, they're doing a year and then leaving to join the regulars, which is great in a way, but in some ways it means they've then got to train another 100 people to, to replace them. What we're trying to do now is attract specials who want to remain as specials for a good number of years, which is quite difficult to sort of portray that in, in an advert. But that's what we're looking for, people who want to join the specials not to join the regulars, but to give something back to the community. And we're always open to offers from people um, who, who fit, that, uh, fit that criteria. OK, bro, we're going to move on now to the um, next selected question from the ones that were sent in. Um, this one is from Geoffrey Ogden. But I believe, I don't know where he is, there he is, sir. But I believe you would like me to read this out on your behalf. OK. Um, so, Jeffrey's asking, um, what do you propose to do to help pedestrians and wheelchair users regain the pavements? He says, motorists park their vehicles on them, cyclists ride on them, householders leave wheelie bins on them, irrespective of whether it's waste collection day. Um, what measures will you take to achieve obstruction-free access along our pavements and footpaths? Do you know what? I, this gets raised with me so often um, because I, I think it's well the frustration it, it can limit people's life can't it you know if you can't get past um, a blockage you know it can keep people stuck indoors and you know maybe we've all been a bit you know too complacent about the effects that this kind of um, uh, obstacle in the streets uh, can have um, we've got uh, World Health Organization status as the most age-friendly UK city region you know I like that, but I don't want to very much just to pass itself on the back and say, oh, we're perfect, and we're not. You know, there are things we need to do to, to support people to be more active, to get out and about. Now, many of the issues fall to local councils, so it's not necessarily for me to, to say exactly how they should manage their roads and their, and their pavements. However, there is one thing that I am doing which answers uh, your point directly. I uh, appointed Chris Boardman a year ago. Um, Chris, the Olympic gold medal winning cyclist, um, not just as our cycling commissioner, was cycling and walking commissioner. And actually, if you, if you speak to him, he always turns it around and says, I'm the walk, you know, he, he sees you know, the walking side of things as actually more fundamental, actually, in terms of his, his role. And what he's been doing is, is looking at these issues. How do we develop communities that support simple everyday activity? And he's not come at it from the kind of, you know, the, the cyclist with all the lycra on and you know, the other kind of like, but he's, he's, he said that we want a simple test, you know, a double, mum with a double buggy test or somebody in a wheelchair, uh, a 12 year old on a bike, you know, he said we need streets that give those groups confidence to go out and use the streets, you know, I think TFGM call it a streets for all uh, agenda. And Chris has been working over the last year on, on his thinking. Um, some might kind of challenge whether I was right to do this, but I gave him a big budget to do this. We uh, were given some funding in the budget last year by the government. I've allocated the majority of it, 160 million pounds of it, uh, to improving walking and cycling provision across Greater Manchester, because actually it, it, that benefits everybody. Every single man, woman and child in Greater Manchester will benefit from the provision of better pavement space, better crossings, more cycle lanes, everybody, all 10 boroughs. If I spent that money on Metrolink, one fraction of one borough would have a benefit and nobody else would have seen anything. So I put that money behind him. He's developed his plan. I don't know if you've all uh, had a chance to, to, to look at it. It's called B-Lines, um, you know, obviously taking the symbol of the B. He, he's wanting to develop new routes, new cycling and walking routes uh, across Greater Manchester that is, a, is about providing much higher standard um, crossings, uh, paths, cycleways. I wouldn't want to say to you tonight that that solves everything. Of course it doesn't. But what it has kick-started is 
kind of a new partnership between the GM level and our councils in saying, well, you know, let's take another look at how streets are being organised and let's see if we can start to, to put in place much, much higher standard schemes that, that actually don't treat the pedestrian as the, the lowest form of, of life in the, in the travel world. Actually, we should start there, shouldn't we? And, um, and then maybe the motorist has to give a little bit to, um, to provide better crossings for, for pedestrians. So that's what we're doing. Um, it's very much a bottom-up process. We want people to feed into the B-Line's work and help us develop these plans. But it is absolutely about walking and cycling uh, together. Little things like wheelie bins can be a right pain, though, can't they, if people leave them out? I mean, is, is there... I mean, we've got the Chief Executive of the Council here. Hello. Uh, is, is there anything that can be done in terms of simple things like that that I guess members of the public can contribute to? Residents, is there an awareness thing there? Is there something that can be done there? Yeah, I think, I think actually the, what Andy's talked about in terms of walking and cycling is quite important because it's about, about a change of mindset. I've come from a cabinet meeting at the council this evening. The councillors are still all left there making decisions. But one of the decisions that was made before I left was actually about a traffic regulation order in Norden. And there was a focus on the vehicle safety because of parking on the street. There was a massive pushback about reducing the amount of parking. But what the councillors took into account quite strongly was the fact that parking was also preventing people using the footpaths properly and would have stopped the buggy, would have stopped the wheelchair. And that was a key part of their thinking when they approved that order. And I th do think it is about changing our approach and getting a better balance between vehicles that have ruled the ro roads for far too long and the sort of things that um, Chris Borden has been uh, articulating in, in B-Lines. And wheelie bins. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. Has anyone got anything to add to... Oh, there's a lady at the back, Smith, if you can. Um, my mobility, I would say, is extremely good. And I do empathise with a gentleman who possibly may know somebody or have to use a wheelchair. But I would say a lot of people's um, mobility in this borough has been hindered a lot by Virgin Media, who are digging up our pavements, actually leaving them unhe uneven. So even somebody who can walk properly is having problems. Um, I'm just wondering how it was allowed to happen across the whole borough, whether Virgin Media are going to give us it all for free and what the council or Andy Burnham can do about rectifying the pavements back to how they were. I mean, they weren't brilliant before, but they're not as bad as they are now. Yeah. Um, I think the truth is, I mean, maybe uh, Steve would want to come in again on this, because I don't know all the local details, but they do have more power than they should, in my view, to kind of drive a bit of brush on over at local councils when it, you know, they, they've got a lot of power to dig up the roads and the pavements. And I, I would like to see councils with more power to, um, to, to monitor what they do. Um, I'm more than happy to, um, to, from tonight, take that forward with them. You know, I, I'm, I'll get the evidence together from the council and um, I will challenge them with it. Because if they've dug up your pavements and haven't put them back to an acceptable standard, then they need to be challenged about that. Yeah, I mean, Andy, Andy's absolutely right. The, 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 the balance of power between the utilities generally and local authorities is not right. Um, it was a subject of a council debate um, back earlier this year, in uh, April, I think it was. Um, and I was asked to write to the Secretary of State, pointing that out and asking for some action. Um, that needs to be rebalanced. What the council is doing is it's put some money aside to deal with um, potholes, but also, it doesn't always get mentioned, also to put some money into making sure that our footpaths are in, in better order too. So there are things we can do in terms of investment, but the real problem is that these utilities um, have too much power. There are, there are some controls, but not enough controls in place. So I will do that from tonight. You know, picking up on what's just been said, I'll, you know, I'll, I will... I will get in touch with them and I will um, challenge them on that. Okay, gentlemen with the glasses. Uh, I'm, I'm volunteering in Manchester at a charity called Back on Track and we do something called Out and About Group and we go out and about in Manchester looking at the various places and there's a brilliant thing in Manchester called the Green Mile 
They've linked together all the parks, Heaton Park, all the various yeah. parks, and they put like little walkways going through. Would that be a way to get the bikes off the pavement, to get the uh, to like link the cycle tracks through those parks? That would at least help to clear the pavements. Is that a good point? It's a very very good point, and it's actually part of the thinking of beelines, to be honest. Um, so what Chris has tried to do is rather than just create cycleways on roads and dig up the roads and cause arguments with motorists. He's cleverly tried to link quieter back streets with, with off-street uh, towpaths on canals and disused railways and parks. So he's trying to create new routes that weave through. And if he needs a bit of interconnecting infrastructure here and there, that's, that's how he's intending to use uh, the money. So that's the logic of the B-Lines uh, approach, effectively. That, I find that so many places where 56 miles would be in place. I'll yeah. I think what we've got is we've got lots of good provision in bits, but sometimes it doesn't all connect properly together. But also, um, if we're honest, the 10 councils all do something slightly different when it comes to cycling provision, and that's confusing as well. So again, part of the Beeline's concept is what's the right standard for Greater Manchester so that people can have confidence everywhere that the provision will be at a certain level. So what we're doing is, he's, Chris has got his money at the GM level, and what we're saying to councils is you can access it as long as you're building to the standard and building to the B-Lines plan. And that's the kind of work that we've got going on at the moment. This uh, Friday, the combined authority meets, uh, meets here in Rochdale uh, and we will be approving the first, um, the first uh, I think, 15 or so uh, grants to our councils to, to start putting in place the B-Lines infrastructure. So this isn't you know, me talking about something that's long far off in the, in the future. This is starting to come through straight away. Thank you. Oh, gentlemen, from here. <clears throat> Hello, Andy. Uh, Shamshul Ali here. <clears throat> this uh, B line, this cycle lanes that you're talking about, I don't know whether you've been on Wimsler Road in Manchester. That is absolute chaos when they put the cycle lines in there. It's a uh, it's absolutely pandemonium there. We've spoken, I've spoken to a lot of the restaurant owners and everything. The road was already too narrow, and then it's become even more narrower. You need to have a wider road before you can put these cycle lanes in. It's just been, as you know, it's very, very chaotic there. And I think you have to really look at it and look at the practical way of putting these things in uh, place. But yeah. Wimsdale Road has been just absolutely <laughs> destroyed, as I might say. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think there's been, uh, what's, let's say, patchy uh, kind of uh, uh, experience, isn't there? Some have worked well, some less well. And, but that's what Chris has been saying. He wants, he's trying to learn all of the experience of those, of those different uh, schemes. Uh, and he's trying to do it in a slightly clever way where the provision is not going to be that type of segregated provision all over Greater Manchester. Some of it will, you're more likely to get to that as you're getting closer to the city centre, but maybe out in the wider, in the boroughs, it might be, it might be different. So he, he is trying to take on board that, I, you know, I, I assure you. Some of it will mean possibly less space for motorists, let's be honest about, about that. But, you know, we have a major air quality issue uh, here. We have parts of Greater Manchester where the air is in breach of legal limits. And the sad thing is, that also tends to be in the poorest communities. So, you know, on what basis is it acceptable for us to carry on saying that the poorest kids are fine walking to school, breathing in the most polluted air? I mean, it's not fine, is it? You know, we, we can't carry on in that way. So cycling and walking is part of it, but so are more electric buses, vehicles. You know, we need a, a big change, I think, in terms of how we think about transport and, and, uh, and mobility. And don't just kind of have a, you know, the car rules and we all just have to, you know, and, and yeah, you know, don't create conflict and fuss for the sake of it, definitely not. But it, equally, some change will have to be made that, it, that is, is going to be, um, be challenging. Okay, um, moving on to, uh, this is a local issue, and it's actually sparked a petition. Um, Robin Parker, uh, do you want to read your question that you've got for Mayor Andy Burnham tonight? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, the seven tower blocks of College Bank, known as the Seven Sisters, are a dominant feature of Rochdale's skyline. They were built in the 60s by Rochdale Council 
to an extremely high standard, not only to enable slum clearance, but also to attract professional people into the town by offering quality accommodation. They are currently in the ownership of Rochdale Borough White Housing, which is now separate from the council. RBH are planning to demolish the four larger blocks, redevelop the other three and build 120 townhouses, making a net deficit of approximately 400 properties on the College Bank footprint alone. The Save the Seven Sisters campaign has a petition of 600 signatures of residents opposed to the demolition and wide support from diverse communities around the town. RBH are saying they cannot obtain funding to improve the blocks, only to demolish a new build. We feel that this is a travesty which will result in the loss of quality, valuable housing stock. The question is, is there any shift in the funding regimes of either national or regional governments to enable these properties to be retained and improved? Well, thank you very much uh, for, your, um, for your question and I will be honest and say I don't know all of the, you know, the local uh, circumstances and I wouldn't want to, you know, to sit here and claim, but nor do I necessarily have a responsibility for them so I don't want to also look like I can do something that I can't so I just, just need to be honest about that but I can uh, seek to answer your question and, and give what comment I can. In terms of funding, uh, the answer at a great Manchester level is, is, is no, sadly. There isn't uh, funding available um, to, to refurbish in the way that, um, uh, that, that I think you're, you're, you're asking. Um, we have a debate going on at the moment, uh, I think co colleagues were at it uh, a couple of weeks ago, around uh, homes that have the cladding on them, which is now illegal, and we're in a position where we have no you know, we completely feel sorry for all those residents, but we have no budget necessarily to, to help deal with that, um, with that situation. Uh, so from our point, in terms of what we have got at the GM level, I, I'm afraid we don't necessarily have that funding. There was, however, meant to be a government green paper today on social housing. And it, it doesn't seem to have, have appeared uh, and the frustrating thing is this is the last day before Parliament enters its summer recess. Uh, so it suggests that that paper now will not appear for, um, well, what is it now, uh, two or three months till Parliament returns. Uh, that may, I wouldn't want to say definitely, uh, change the context in which your campaign is being run. It may, I don't know. But that green paper, I think, is important. Well, bear in mind, a green paper is obviously not the firm proposals that will lead to, uh, to funding. Uh, the only thing, I mean, I, from what I know of the issue, I was told that it wouldn't result in a net deficit in terms of housing uh, provision. Um, and of course, you know, the, the issue is for uh, Rochdale Borough-wide housing, and I, and I guess the council um, uh, indirectly, is, is it right to spend the money, you know, refurbishing, or is it right to, to build new stock that then will last for the same period of time that the, the original blocks have been up and I think those are, those are difficult, uh, difficult uh, challenges. You know, what, what I certainly know is obviously the points that you've just made, made have, been, have been heard uh, and it's, it's in the end a decision for, uh, for local people with, with the council uh, to find out what, what is the right uh, and obviously with, with the housing provider but uh, you know, I, I you know, what I can say is I'm prepared to, to, to take a, a greater look at the issue. Um, I'll certainly try and find out some answers for you from the government with regard to housing uh, funding. Uh, and uh, perhaps that might, um, you know, might, might help in terms of uh, how a final way forward can be found. Oh, we've got a question here. Andy, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to Rochdale. Uh, you came when you were campaigning to become the mayor, and I did say then, Andy, you've got a big task ahead, and you hope that you come back to Rochdale, and hopefully with a, a big money bank. Um, <laughs> so, welcome. Uh, after that, I, want to, I am the local councillor for where the uh, College Bank Estate is based. I've been to RBA, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, 
consultation, all the consultations. And I'm not convinced, as a local councillor, that they've got the sums really right. And just to reassure Robin and his campaign team that we, we, I, as a local councillor, along with my colleagues, are right behind the campaign and we would do whatever we possibly can. However, tonight, I, I've sort of witnessed everything and I feel that perhaps politically, no disrespect to you, Andy, uh, because we're all in it together at a Greater Manchester level, we're too nice. We've got to put the blame where it lies, and that is with the government. We're pussyfooting around for no need. We've got to say it as it is, and that's why all, all the uh, crime figures, all the low numbers of policing, their transport, we want, you know, we've got far too many cars. People are you choosing uh, private vehicles instead of resorting to the public transport, which is unaffordable, not reliable, sorry Bob, and what we need to do is to get these facts right, people will come out of the cars, but going back to College Bank, there are seven blocks with between 119 to 117 flats in uh, each block. I cannot see how RBH under modern planning laws are going to rehouse that number of people. We as the local authority, due to popular public demand, are developing our town centre. These flats are in the town centre. They are taking people away from the town centre. As you know, with the power of the internet, town centres are becoming defunct. Apart from uh, Manchester itself, all of the towns are suffering. And I generally believe that housing, there's a national shortage, regional shortage, and local shortage of housing. I only have to go to RBH's office, like I did yesterday, to see the droves of people crying out uh, for properties to be rehoused in. And we, we can't let this happen. And if, uh, there's another estate right next to it, which is under the hammer as well. And I genuinely feel that something needs to be done. And we do need your support, Andy. I know you're restricted by law, etc., and everything else. But it's a plea. And as far as the campaign's concerned, it's only going to hotten up now. Thank you. Okay. No, that, well, that, that's, you know, I didn't know, you know, what, what the position was of uh, the local ward councillors, but that, that, that is really important for me to... Uh, hear that, and I'm sure the campaign appreciate that that public uh, uh, statement of support. Working with the council, we have the town centre challenge, and Rochdale is part of it. So I do have a, a role here, um, and I can uh, you know bring some influence to bear, perhaps to see if we can move, as I say, the, the issue uh, forward. The funding that you asked, you know, where's my checkbook for Rochdale? Um, I, I do have access to some funds. It wouldn't be for refurbishment. It would be to, to stimulate, to clean up land, possibly, to generate more town centre development. That is what I want to see as mayor. I want more development in Brownfield in our town centres because actually that brings people to live in our town centres. It keeps them vibrant and it keeps the town centre facilities. And you know that's the way we're approaching the rewrite of the spatial framework. And you know, we need to see the. There's also still going to be difficult decisions as part of that, but we need to maximise regeneration of our, of our town centres. So, you know, I am, maybe I'll meet with the ward councillors and, um, and, and take a, a broader look at the issue as, as part of that. I mean, I wouldn't want to, to sort of claim tonight that I can kind of come in and um, solve things because it isn't necessarily my role to, but maybe I can help with information and um, can, can broker discussions uh, with, with, with ward uh, councillors as well. So, you know, l l let me take that one away and um, uh, see, where, see where we can take it. We mentioned spatial framework and I know green belts, another uh, big issue, not just in Rochdale, but uh, across Greater Manchester. Um, there's a number of campaigns underway, obviously, um, it, involving issues of that. Is Chris Sandham here? Chris, do you want to ask your question that you've submitted? Uh, good evening, Andy. Good evening, Chris. Greenbelt or countryside around our towns and villages are the lungs of our communities. The health benefits from these areas are priceless in various ways to many people. 
Why do the majority of councils in the Greater Manchester Combined Authority still want to press ahead and build on Greenbelt? Is our Greenbelt safe, including the sports fields and parks in the areas of Rochdale and Oldham? Well, um, we're in the middle of this debate at the moment because you might remember when I stood for election, I said that I wanted a fundamental rewrite of the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework in line with the principle that I just was outlining, brownfield first. Um, because I think developers sometimes go straight to those green sites on the edges of towns because they're, they're cheaper to develop and perhaps they develop higher value properties in those, in those places. And when I looked at that first draft of the spatial framework that I think you're referring to that came out um, in 2016, what I saw there was a, a developer-led approach to all of this. And I don't think that necessarily will ever deliver the right answer for the people who, who live here. Of course, we need more homes. So, you know, there's no point claiming that we can back off all of these decisions. We, we can't, you know, we do need to build more homes. We have a housing crisis, we need to, to come up with a response to that. But if you followed the logic of that first draft of the spatial framework, I don't think it would have solved the housing crisis because it wouldn't have built homes that people could, who live here could necessarily afford. So at the moment we are, and we have been having a rethink internally about all of these issues. And we're looking at a new approach to housing policy in Greater Manchester that is more about building homes at every level for, so that people can afford those properties, opening up sites in different places to support that different kind of development, and here's the bit that, that um, gets to your, your, your question, and reduces the take from uh, much cherished green space and green, uh, and green belt. Now, I'm on with that process at the moment. The only thing I, I will be honest and say to you is, I have been told that under, because you know, bear in mind, it's not just the councils voluntarily saying that they want to build all the, they're under massive pressure from the government uh, to, to agree house building targets every year. So, you know, this pressure is coming down on them from, uh, from Whitehall. Um, they have to clearly respond to that. And what they say to me is, we can't necessarily deal with all of that through brownfield, because there isn't the brownfield sites, which I think is, is, is a reasonable point. The only thing I would say in response to that is, we actually do have a lot more brownfield that could be used, but because it's contaminated, or because it has uh, issues with it in terms of clear up and demolition of buildings, it's not currently viable on the, on the current uh, funding basis. We've been given a, a housing uh, fund by the government as part of our housing deal, where we can open up more brownfield sites to development that we could, we could before. And that will further help us to, um, to make that shift. But I don't want to sit here tonight and say to you that there won't be some difficult decisions as part of the Great Manchester Spatial Framework. There will be. But I am working with all of the councils to say we must minimise uh, the take. We need homes for the next 20 years. We need places that will support jobs of the future uh, for the next 20 years. But we need to do that, respecting our communities, cherishing our green space, and taking the absolute minimum uh, necessary. And that is the kind of clear stricture that I've placed on the rewrite of the spatial framework. You will have to judge whether or not we've achieved that when it's published. It will now be in October. Because one thing that might give you some encouragement is that the government's figures for um, housing growth have been revised downwards because of new population uh, projections. So the pressure is coming down, if you like, rather than going up. Uh, but still, I, I don't want to kind of say to you that there won't still be difficult decisions. There will be. Uh, but we, there will be a further round of consultation on the draft and still plenty of time for, for, for local communities to make their, make their voice heard. In the end, we're going to need a plan. Because if we don't have a plan, that's the worst of all worlds. If we can't agree the plan, that then is possibly carte blanche for developers to come in and pick off the green sites. So we do need to do a bit of give and take to see if we can come to a, a reasonable compromise about this. Because once we've got that plan, then what green space we've got is probably safer than it would be if there was no plan in place at all. So that's 
and up, you know, as, as open as I can be about where we're up to. Uh, I very much hear what you say, and you know, I am working hard to see if I can get this balance right, but you'll have to be the judge of that when the plan uh, finally sees the light of day. What I can say to you is that you know, all of our councils, all 10, have sought to reduce um, the number of, of, of green sites, and that work is ongoing. So the process, the, the, the direction of travel is in the right direction as far as you're concerned. Whether it goes far enough, as I say, you'll, you'll have to be the judge of that. Okay. Ooh, quite a few questions on this one. Uh, take your pick, yeah, that's fine. Sorry, good evening, Andy. As a head teacher in Littleborough, um, with the ASCO Noble site, which is owned by government, there is a proposal to build a free school on our school playing field. It's not ours, it's council owned land. Now, in my opinion, the development and building of a free school on a larger site would be better because two schools do not use that for their PE and games. So besides utilising that land more efficiently and getting government departments to talk together, I know it's a council issue, so I, I don't know what you can do, but where do my children and Littleborough County Primary School's children do games and PE? Because we have a very good reputation of producing excellent sports people. So, so, sorry, just so, so I understand that, is it taking away your playing field, potentially? The playing fields are owned by the council. There are preferred sites in Littleborough. There's um, two sites preferred. But um, if, my playing field, if the playing fields that we use under custom and practice for the last 30 years are taken away, I don't know what we will do. Because my site, my school is an old school, yeah. highly successful, but we have limited space. So we will have nowhere to do PE games. The same with Littleborough County Primary, which also uses the fields as well. So my governors are extremely concerned, as you can imagine, because we want to keep our young children fit and we want to continue doing the excellent work we do. Oh, well, honestly, I mean, I, you know, I, again, without knowing all the local details, I'll just give you an off-the-cuff answer. I'm passionate about school sport, physical activity, you know, absolutely passionate about it. And I would hate to see a situation where you lose access to, to green space. I'm actively out there promoting the Daily Mile in all of our schools, you know, get kids doing something every day, build a culture of physical activity. And the idea that that will be taken away for, you know, I'm going to get a bit political now, I'm sorry, but for a free school, which I'm afraid I don't believe is that, you know, we've seen them fail all over the place. And, you know, what evidence is there that that is actually the right, you know, I, well, you know, maybe some people support it. But I, I, I personally believe in an education system that is about fairness across all schools and not one type of school being prioritised over others. And what I perceive at the moment, and this goes back to Gove, is an education policy for some kids and some schools, but not all kids and all schools. And I don't believe in that. I believe in comprehensive education. I believe all schools are equal. And I actually would prefer a situation where there was more local uh, control of what goes on in education. The really dam damaging thing is when the free school legislation went through, the power was given to the Department for Education effectively to take sites off people at a local level to build uh, free schools. So again, it's one of those issues where the ability of the council to object uh, to what's happening. I don't know the full details of this instance, but I don't think it's, it's what it should be. Uh, and that might be part of the problem. There is a need for, there is a need for extra secondary places in Littleborough, as was highlighted in the news, because um, some of our children are having to travel into Rochdale to go to school. So there is a need for extra primary places, but again, you've got demographic data going back 10 years. Um, there's other sites. Um, surely the playing fields that offer curriculum and PE and games has to be um, saved or an alternative site should be developed. Well, I will definitely take that issue away tonight. You know, you know, it was a We've picked up a few issues as we've gone along uh, here, but that one I will. And if I can intervene to, you know, if there's going to be a new school, as you say, is, is needed, at least have it in the, right, in the right place and not do something that then is to the detriment of existing schools. Because that, as I say, is then to prioritise the new school over the existing school, and that just isn't right in principle. And I've, you know, got real concerns at the way, you know, they've thrown money at these new schools that they favour more, and it's often been to the detriment of existing schools because they've not been able to access the money. It's been thrown 
uh, in large quantities. And a lot of these schools have been experimental schools that have failed, and it's just not right. Um, so I'll take that one away, and I hope I can give you some support. Hi Andy. Uh, yeah, is that on? People hear me? Yeah? That's come on there. Hi Andy. Um, I um, am involved in a follow on to that particular question in relation to active sports for youngsters within the community. Um, my role is running a junior sports club that operates out of Bamford um, in, uh, in the borough. Um, and we are at the moment under the, the threat of the long term lease that we've got with the local authority owned site. Uh, with the potential of seeing sports facilities taken away for house building as part of the spatial framework. Um, what I wanted to ask you, following on from what you just said, is that if there was a decision that the council chose to make in relation to selling land that it currently owns to development, um, what degree of intervention and power do you have to be able to step in if you feel, listening to the passion that you've got about not wanting to see sports provision removed, what level of intervention can you use to be able to influence the council to make that decision in relation to the land it owns specifically on Greenbelt rather than privately owned land? Well, I do have power because ultimately the spatial framework is the plan that I have to put forward to the 10 leaders for sign-off. So it's a, it's a, a two-way process and we've got to listen to each other and try and agree a plan between us. But I do have uh, some power here. And there's one thing about informal green space, and I've just said before to the gentleman's question, I would like to protect as much of that as I possibly can, you know, space that's used uh, for informal recreation. However, space for organised sport, I, I, as Mayor of Greater Manchester, I do not want to see any borough lose space for, uh, for sport and physical activity, particularly for young people. So if any was to be taken, it should be reprovided in, in somewhere else. Um, at no cost to the to the sports club as part of any of any development, and I would I would want that to be a very very clear uh, principle. You know, uh, community sports clubs, in my view, do an absolutely fantastic job in our communities. They're often the unsung uh, heroes that don't get enough. No, it's, not, it's not talking about councils; just generally, they don't get enough enough support off off any uh, organisations. And where they have facilities that are used and trusted, you know, they should be cherished and protected. And if there's a need to make a change, then they should be re relocated in, in somewhere else. And I, sp I speak with feeling because tomorrow I'm becoming uh, the president of the Rugby Football League uh, tomorrow. Um, and, you know, as part of my role, I am going to be championing um, amateur rugby league clubs all over, not just Greater Manchester, all over uh, the north, actually. And, you know, at that... I want to then embody my day job as well. That you know, we, we do whatever we can to support the job that you, you do, and that means protecting the places where you play. Uh, we have 700 kids every week that use that space, and yeah. the threat of being sold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Hello, Andy. Um, yeah, it was just about bringing up the, like, the green belt issue, and like, the gentleman was bringing up the, uh, the Bamford, the soccer field, the sports fields at the back. I, I just can't say, understand the policy of the, of the council in Rochdale. It's been well known in the news recently that Rochdale was providing the sports facilities in the Greater Manchester, I believe, it was said in news recently. Is that quiet? Well, there was something news recently about the sports facilities were not, not up to scratch to put towards other boroughs in the uh, Greater yeah. Manchester. The thing is, well, the council seems to understand, they seem to go against their own policy, but it does make sense that they're trying to get people fit out, but they were talking about selling the Bamford field, the, soft, the sports fields off, and then moving them further out to another area. Well, there again, that just means more car use. Uh, people have to travel further. His question is, is I, I just don't seem to understand how, where these councils are coming from with their ideas on the, on the green issues of like Sportsville moving on further out. But it just means that then people have to come from one local area and then travel out further again using cars. They're th therefore creating more pollution. If, if you understand what I'm saying. Well, I, th I think the Chief Executive wants to come in because obviously I don't know all of the, 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 um, the, the local issues. But you, you see where I'm coming from on, on protecting um, space for, for sport. But obviously. 
Uh, just, just picking up the, the Bamford issue, first of all, uh, Andy, I think it's important to, to... That was in the original GMSF that Andy has challenged all the councils in Greater Manchester to look hard at to find ways of reducing greenbelt take and still delivering the housing and employment space that's needed. And Rochdale, in common with all the other districts, have been doing that. There were a number of comments came into us around that particular site there was quite a few comments about retaining somehow those sports facilities and one of the options obviously that's been examined is to maintain that sports facility, reduce the amount of uh, housing in the area but somehow try and use that development to improve those facilities and that's the, the thing that's been considered uh, as part of uh, the next iteration of the plan. I, obviously I can't specifically say that's going to be in the plan because the plan's yet uh, going to be a, a couple of months away from being published, but that's something that is being looked at very hard, I can tell you that. Um, I also probably ought to comment on the schools issue, just to be very clear that we as a council legally have to provide school places. We know we need two new secondary schools, one uh, over in Middleton and one over in the Pennines part of, uh, of Rochdale. Um, we have to make sure that provision is made. However, as Andy said, the way that that's done is not something, you know, we, the council's position is um, not supportive of the education system that drives us down the academy's route. That said, there is no other way of doing it. In terms of the Pennines provision, there have been two possible sites identified that are in council ownership and their cut for can be delivered. One's the Littleborough site that's been uh, mentioned and one's just around the corner from here. Um, the preferred site is that, is the Littleborough site. It's not one thing or the other. The intention is to try and make a development work that works for all the schools that use those, uh, those playing areas. But I have to be honest and say that the, the bidding process that the government imposed was so short that we've not been able to do a full appraisal on that and that's what's being done at the moment. So both the site, that's the preferred site, but both the sites are, have been held current because in case we can't deliver uh, the little recite in the way that we'd like to. I'm going to tie this in quickly, actually, with a question from Andy King, because it's kind of talking about leisure centres and making sure that, you know, we talked about Rochdale and one point that was made was that Rochdale's sporting facilities aren't as up to scratch as maybe uh, other areas. Um, Andy King, are you in the audience? No, he's not. OK, well, I'll read it out quickly. He's basically saying about supporting that the government should support a £1 billion investment into ageing leisure centres to transform them into a new front line of preventative health care for the NHS. So obviously we've heard today about obesity levels hitting an all time yeah. high with children. Um, you know, people here are saying that the sporting facilities are being taken away. Is that something that needs to be focused on in the sense of well, I, I've always believed that. So when I was health secretary, um, I funded um, free swimming for over 60s and under 16s because I, I believe the NHS has got to be much more preventative in its outlook. You know, you've got to, the, the, the best medicine available to, to mankind is physical activity. If you're physically active, you, you're just in a much better place to start dealing with issues around diet and drinking. You just, your mental health is better. And everything, good health, I think, flows from, from uh, physical activity. So I've always kind of advocated a much higher priority on, uh, on the facilities to support physical activity. And you've heard about the Chris Boardman um, investment tonight. But I, you know, and you've heard what I feel about um, community amateur uh, sport. Um, I, I also would like to see the NHS stepping forward, because they're, in the end, the people with mo the most money to make a difference. To, to put put their hand in their pocket, so what you know? How are we making that real? It's not so much refurbishment of, of um, leisure centres that I can can offer tonight. What I can talk about though is a scheme of social prescribing that we want to introduce across Greater Manchester because I, I think it should be the norm in the future that if you go and see your GP, you should be as likely to leave with a um, a referral for exercise or for um, gardening or for whatever it might be than leaving with a prescription for antidepressants because actually a, a kind of system that just constantly dishes out medication it isn't actually going to help you get underneath those issues that are stopping you from having better physical uh, health. So 
Social prescribing is something we are beginning to develop across, across Greater Manchester. And you know, that can then be delivered with sports groups, community groups. And I think it's a win-win, to be honest, because the money that you would otherwise be giving to the pharmaceutical industry, you're actually investing in your own community in better uh, local provision. And you know, these are serious plans. All, all uh, 10 of our clinical commissioning groups are working on thinking around social prescribing. And, that could bring new revenue in to support um, community sport and leisure facilities. Okay. Gentleman at the back, I think I cut you off when you were about to... Oh, sorry, it's, it's a lady. Me. I'm not a sorry. gentleman. <laughs> no, sorry. I was looking at the guy next to you. Sorry. I didn't think you were a man. Oh. <laughs> um, I work in the NHS um, and I've been working with the local authority um, around parenting and changing the culture with parents around the kind of well it's the ACEs so adverse childhood experience and the impact that that has on kind of development and things like outcomes the local ability to go to sports centres and things like that the areas that have been spoken about a bit more affluent than the areas that we're kind of working in um, so I was just wondering what uh, it's a bit tricky to sorry I'm not very good at this I'm so That's nervous awesome. um, it's a bit just to know where you're coming from with regards to the development of children because yeah. I think we've touched on it and the fact that children have no hope I wasn't shocked at all yeah. at all um, one of our local schools really works on the needs um, at the not in education employment or training and they've got really good outcomes because they develop skills for life and social mobility mm -hmm. and I just wondered I know that you're working for speech and language in particular over in Salford and Manchester quite a bit and I'm involved with some of those teams but where do you see it going in areas like Rochdale where we've been a bit further behind than Salford and a bit further behind in the Manchester in things around speech language development parenting yeah. where do you see it going yeah sorry no, so that was really it's very good though it's very good very clear um, so there is a whole agenda as I was saying before about life readiness for older uh, teenagers and that is yeah it's that help with their travel but I also want um, what I call a UCAS system for apprenticeships so I want young people who are not on the university route growing up in a borough like this, to see all the other opportunities that are out there with regard to apprenticeships and be able to apply for them in the same way as young people apply for university. Because I think sometimes those not on the university route struggle to see what's, what's out there for them at the end of, the end of school. So that's a, a curriculum for life is a big part of what we're also doing to give them those life skills to get into those opportunities. Yeah. However, to answer your question, we also recognise though that Young people may never be in that position unless we've also invested them much, much earlier on. And that's why we have a focus on what we call school readiness. So in Greater Manchester, 40,000 or so uh, four-year-olds will start reception class every uh, September. At the moment, about a third of them are not considered to be school ready. That is, they don't have the basic language and social development <coughs> to support their learning. And so the risk is they never catch up at primary school and then they are the young people who struggle in, in secondary school. And you've got to go right back, as you rightly are saying, to there. We have got a big programme of work on in Greater Manchester to improve um, our approach to school readiness. And I, I actually can tell you it's working. We are, we are uh, beginning to get those numbers uh, down uh, and improving overall rates of, of school readiness. You are, yeah. Sure, and you are in some ways, not in others, but I mean, you know, particularly in terms of, you know, young people growing up with uh, bigger uh, disadvantage. I think that is true, um, and it's my job to make sure then that we get the resource in to match that uh, match that need. So you're absolutely right. Um, I, I um, don't shy away from that at all. You know, we've got funding at a great amount of level to help. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. And we're trying to make sure that the best practice from other parts of Greater Manchester is obviously embraced, embraced everywhere. So it's a really big agenda. Just to make it simple for you, though, you know, this is the bit where the public services don't often help because we have health visitors doing their thing, but not necessarily linked to the primary schools where those kids might be going to. And what we need to do is try and get them all having one conversation about the young person who needs extra help with their parents involved as well, maybe with some community support. That's what our school readiness program is all, is all about. And it's beginning to deliver results, but you know, we recognize we've got a long way to go. But uh, you're absolutely asking the right question.
Okay, I think there's a gentleman already got the microphone, and it is a gentleman this time. <laughs> it's just an addition to the point that was mentioned about the sports facilities, playing fields in Little Bower. It is used by two schools, but it's also used by a lot of amateur sports organisations, football, rugby, for youngsters and for adults as well. Just to add to that. Yeah. I mean, just, just on that, I will, I will have a look at it from, from tonight. I mean, I think the Chief Executive has explained that there is a, a pressure that can't necessarily be denied because the government does have powers to, um, to, to, to intervene in these situations and obviously school places are needed. However, it should be done in a way that doesn't lose an asset or access for young people to, to, to recreational facilities. So. As I say, I mean, I might be able to bring something. I'm not going to sit here tonight and say, "Oh, I'll come." And, you know, I'm not. It's a difficult situation, and you know, th th there's a, a pressure here, as I say, that can't be denied from the council's point of view. Um, but what I might be able to do is broker, help broker a, a better solution. I might be able to involve Sport England, uh, who may be able to, to, to help bring something to the table. So, you know, I'm prepared to do that. You know, see if we can um, add, add something into this mix that might end up with a solution that works for everybody. Can't promise, but I'll give it a go. Bit conscious of time, um, and we've had quite a few uh, questions coming through on Twitter with the hashtag AskAndyGM. So I'm just going to do a bit of a fire round for okay. you. Um, one's about transport, basically better access for wheelchair users. Um, someone saying it's a nightmare at times, uh, but a lot of it is down to poor attitudes of staff. Um, so there's that one. There's also uh, an issue with litter. What are your plans to clear up things like chewing gum and litter in the streets um, and finally I know you mentioned it earlier about the uh, bus passes someone's mentioning that their uh, son is about to go to sixth form and the current bus pass is still expensive for us so you've got yeah it is you know I, I recognize that and you know it, my daughter went from Goldborn where I live to Wigan recently and she paid four quid and you know she's 16 that is a a huge amount of money isn't it for young people to be forking out for a five mile bus journey in London bus journeys are capped at one pound fifty you know why is that you know how can we have such a discrepancy like that so bus travel is a real barrier and it's this thing I was saying before about the hope agenda you know because of the cost of travel here it, it means that some young people set their sights of terms of where they feel they can go in life to the borough that they are or even less than that the community where they live and they can't see how they can go further afield because they just can't see a way of how they can fund it you know and we have to do something about that and it's why i'm absolutely passionate about this idea of a free bus pass for 16 to 18 year olds just at the moment when they are kind of branching out trying to spread their wings give them that help to to, to get from where they where they are to where they want to to go and um, yeah, it's a policy that I'm really determined to bring through. Whether I can do it soonish, I don't know, because I'm in the middle of a discussion with the bus companies and others about it at the moment. But um, I want to bring it in as quickly as I possibly can. And it, and it has to be said that the Labour Party nationally has embraced uh, the policy as well. So, you know, I think it's an agenda that's gaining traction, um, and rightly so, in my view, because young people need more help to get on in life than we've been giving them as a society. And you can't keep kicking them back and then you know, blame them for all the ills of the world. You know, we, we've got to give them more support and uh, I, I believe in that very strongly. Chewing gum on the pavements, I think that's one I'm... <laughs> wow, I'm going to have to pass on, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> wow, <laughs> I don't know what... The, the... Somebody didn't like that question over there, but... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. That's a more council uh, uh, issue, but uh, I know it's a... A big issue for I people. suppose while you're speaking to the buses about the bus passes and working with the bus companies there, uh, I mean, they don't specify, or do they specify in particular? Uh, it's just transport in general, but what about wheelchair access? Again, yeah, that's a... It's, it's a massive issue as well. I should have you know, picked up on that one. Um, real frustration for us is that half of our train stations in Greater Manchester are not wheelchair accessible. Now, how 
in this day and age, can that be uh, allowed to be the case? Half of our stations, 98 stations, half not wheelchair accessible. We asked for devolved control of our train stations and it was denied by Mr Grayling, who incidentally found 600 million more for Crossrail in London uh, today. You know, this kind of approach to transport just cannot carry on. How can we be expected to put up with a, a, a second class rail service is being polite actually, isn't it? You know, delayed, cancelled, overcrowded, but, but a large portion of the population can't even get on the trains because they can't even get in the station. That is the northern train system. Not northern trains, but no, mm. northern railways in the north of England. And yet, more and more money seems to be shoveled into to projects uh, in London. So, you know, we are getting angrier and angrier about the discrepancy between transport in the north and transport in the south. And our voice is getting louder on this issue. All of the uh, northern mayors and, and leaders of councils are uh, getting together in Newcastle in September to, to create what we call a convention of the north, where we're going to try to start to speak with one voice on this issue so that we get your voice heard more loudly on the national, national stage. We cannot allow a situation to carry on where you know, we're always at the back of the queue for transport investment. It's got to change. We should be at the front of that queue. After all, they all came here promising us a northern powerhouse. Four years on, I think we're all saying, well, where the, where the hell is it? You know, start putting forward the investment to make it a reality. And the truth of the matter is we haven't seen that yet when it comes to transport. I think we're going to end now because we're running out of time, but I just wanted to end on something that's actually close to my heart uh, and an issue that I've been working on recently, um, which Andy has been is working alongside me on, and that's holiday hunger. And I know that that was a question that somebody submitted uh, to this session. Um, holiday hunger is a massive issue, um, and it's something that Hits Radio has been uh, doing a campaign on in terms of filling the food banks, and it's something that we shouldn't have to do in this day and age. But I've seen appeals on uh, Facebook, Twitter of food banks putting out um, that they're running out of food and they're actually having to turn families away. Uh, so we launched a campaign called Fill the Food Banks uh, and it was supported by Andy because when you look at the real issue of it and the poverty in our communities um, and, and the reasons that's causing the poverty and one of the things we mentioned was universal credit, um, it, it shouldn't be happening. Um, Andy, I guess really I wanted you to sort of kind of finish on that really on, on what needs to be done in terms of, um, you know, it's great that we can all come together and help support our communities, but it is a, a deeper issue. Massively so. And it's just not right, is it? You know, the schools are broken up. There'll be some kids who won't be eating uh, now uh, all day because they, they, they can't um, get a school, a school meal. And that just, just cannot possibly be right in a country that is one of, still one of the richest countries uh, in the world. Uh, and... You're, you're right, universal credit, I'm afraid, has, has, has had a large part to play uh, in this. We are going to present a report to our combined authority soon on the real effect of universal credit in Greater Manchester. And, it, and it's not good. It's really not good. The delays that they put families through plunge them into a spiral of debt that they, they just can't recover from then. You know, they, they then accumulate a problem that then means that they are then, even when the money does come through, they've already kind of gone into a crisis situation and then they can't recover. Now, we have councils here, Wigan, Oldham, that were pilots for universal credit and all of this was said back to the government when they were bringing it through and they just, I'm afraid, didn't, didn't listen. And universal credit is going to cause real damage, uh, in my view, if it's rolled out fully across all ten of our, our boroughs. And it isn't just um, uh, child poverty and hunger, it's obviously the issue of rising rough sleeping and homelessness, which is a big priority uh, of, of mine. Um, you know, all of this shouldn't be happening, I don't think, in this, in this day and age. And you know, I really applaud the campaign that you've, you've launched. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, that's a responsible local media, I think, using the voice that you have and the power that you have to, 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 to ensure that we, we don't have kids going hungry this, uh, this uh, summer. But it's a really sad state of affairs, you know. You shouldn't need to do it. Councillor Chris Furlong here tonight, he did a few marathons recently to help my homelessness fund and I think a local food bank as well. We're all doing these things, aren't we? To, I'm raising, I'm donating part of my salary to the Mayor's Homelessness Fund, you know, rightly, because if I'm honest with you, I think pay of some people in society has gone way too high. 
and other people at the bottom are living in terrible insecurity where one week to the next they don't know if they're going to earn enough to feed their kids now that is just isn't right and i think we need to sort of say that and start calling for for change um and you know whenever we support something like fill the food banks that hits radio are doing we do need to point out that it shouldn't be necessary to be doing this but we're going to do it because we need to do it however it, it shouldn't be uh this way in a, in a decent and civilised society. And I think this country's got to get the plot back really and, and stop allowing this stuff to happen. Other countries do not allow zero hours contracts. And we need to be saying why therefore are they inflicted on many, many thousands of people in Greater Manchester who therefore don't know how much they're going to earn from one week uh, to the next. And when they're in those insecure jobs, and also in insecure private rented housing, they are then just a bit of bad luck away from being in the doorways because, you know, a couple of bad decisions, no way of paying the rent, and then they're, they're there. People cannot live with that level of insecurity in their life because what it does is it eats away at their mental health. You know, why is mental health the growing issue of our times? It's because people are living with that stress and that insecurity, and it just simply cannot, cannot go on. We're proposing what we call a good employment charter in Greater Manchester. So we're going to create a new standard whereby we say this is what modern good employment should be about and it will deal with this issue of wages and insecure work. And to give it real teeth we're going to be saying that you know really the public sector shouldn't be shouldn't be procuring with public funds from organizations that are not good employers. So we're going to try in our own world to sort of lift the whole whole standards but you know, the time has come for a different debate about all of these things and to, to close the gap between the bottom and the top um, because, you know, things just, just cannot carry on. We cannot carry on with food banks and fundraising being just part now of what we, what we do. Kids should be fed full stop whether they're in school or out and we should have a system of work and, and support for people that allows that and doesn't mean that any parent ever worries about any of that because that is what a decent and civilised society should do. Right, that's actually all we have time for. So thank you for everybody who took part in uh, today's questions and answers sessions. I hope you got a lot out of it. And let's uh, have another round of applause for our Mayor Andy Burnham for helping to tackle some issues. Can I just say um, a massive thanks to you, actually, Michelle. Oh, um, you <laughs> shared it very uh, well. Thanks to all of you for coming. Um, a real range, you know, a good debate in the right way on the issues, different views exchanged, exactly that's what it should be. And I'm just really grateful that you've given your time uh, tonight. You know, the way I see devolution just very quickly before you go is, there's no point me coming into this job and then doing the same old kind of approach to politics where, you know, it's all about point scoring and all the rest of it. You know, this is an opportunity to do things a little differently and involve people more in the decisions that we're taking. And what we've tried to do tonight is be honest with you about some of the issues that we're, we're dealing with. But that's what these Q&As are about. You know, use the power that we've got to involve people more and create a healthier way of doing politics. That, that is what this uh, whole process uh, of, of, of work we've got underway is about. So thanks for being a part of it. You know, there are issues that we'll come back to you on that you know, you'll, you'll see where our thinking gets to. But I, I just think if we go in along in this, this way, I think we're going to create something that has much more um, uh, benefit for people in terms of the way decisions are made and the way we do, we do things. And I, and I do hope that Greater Manchester can lead the way a little, if you like, in, in, in creating a new, a new approach uh, uh, to issues. So thanks very much for, for coming and your, your contributions have been, have been listened to and much value tonight. So thank you very much, everyone. Oh, the uh, oh, here he is. We'll try and get mine out again.